When the procession had passed the guardhouse, we saw the troops of the 66th and the 20th line regiments, as well as the island militia, drawn up in line on the little heights, which are on the left of the road. Soldiers and officers were in attendance of sadness, of reflection, of meditation. The soldiers stood with the muzzles of their muskets on the ground, with their hands crossed on the butts and with lowered heads, while the officers held the hilts of their swords level with their chins, the blades turned downward, and I think their left hands raised to their shakos. The drums were covered with crepe. The flags unrolled and in mourning were lowered as the car passed and the band of each corps played funeral airs. If the emperor's most implacable enemies could have seen his funeral procession passing before the English soldiers, sighs would have escaped from their breasts and tears would have moistened their eyelids. When we arrived at Hutsgate, we saw Lady Lowe and her daughter both in deep mourning. The liveliest emotion was depicted on their faces. Tears ran down their cheeks. Opposite the road which comes from Longwood, there is a little terrace on which the artillery was in battery. The guns were loaded, and the matches burning. After passing Hutsgate, the head of the procession turned to the right and stopped halfway to Alarm House. There a little road had been made leading to the bottom of what is called Geranium Valley, where many people were already assembled around a clump of willows in which a grave had been dug to receive the emperor's body, not far from the spring to which they went to draw water for the illustrious prisoner. The procession stopped. Those who were on horseback dismounted. The grenadiers who had accompanied the car again took the coffin on their shoulders and on the way down, everyone marched in the same order as before. When the grenadiers had gone a third of the way, they were replaced by eight soldiers of another corps and the marines, too, wishing to have their share, took the coffin. These last, after covering a third of the distance which remained, laid down their precious load at the edge of the grave. After the procession had passed all the troops had followed it and had formed in line on the road which we had just left and which runs along the valley they were all to be spectators of the sad and imposing scene in which the remains of a great man were to disappear beneath the surface of the earth the inhabitants of the town of all conditions of all ages occupied the bottom of the valley and groups of men and women more or less numerous were ranged on the steep sides of the mountain the valley looks at this point like a great funnel. The grave on the edge of which the Marines had just laid the coffin was dug in the middle of a group of four or five willows. It was some 10 feet deep. The four sides of the parallelogram were lined with masonry. From top to bottom, a trough of free stone was to be covered with a broad and long flagstone. This house was one of those which were to be used in the new house. A crab winch had been set up and the ropes were ready. The surrounding ground was covered with black cloth, which framed the opening of the tomb. When the Grand Marshal had removed the sword and scabbard and Monsieur de Montsalon, the cloak and pall, the coffin was placed on two thick oaken planks. Then the priest came forward to the edge of the grave and pronounced the custom prayers in a loud voice. At this moment, the servants were on the north side facing the entrance of the Grand Marshal. Monsieur de Montsalon and the priests were on the two short sides, and the English on the fourth with the governor, Admiral Lambert, and Monsieur de Montchenu in the middle. When the first prayer was ended, they lowered the coffin with the help of the winch. While sighs escaped from the breasts of those present, and tears watered the ground, where henceforth the remains of the greatest hero of modern times were going to rest. At the same moment, the reports of the cannon came three separate times to strike our ears, and these reports were repeated by the echoes of the neighboring valley. Silence followed, and the priest, blessing the grave, recited the last prayers. When the religious ceremony was ended, the governor asked Generals Bertrand and Montalon whether they were going to pronounce an oration. When both replied in the negative on Sir Hudson Lowe's order, the winch was raised, the large flagstone in the center of which was a strong, movable ring. The stone was hung over the grave. It was lowered little by little, and soon it closed the bottom of the vault. Then the workmen hastened down with their trowels. They removed the ring, sealed the stone, and covered it with cement. Every 
everything was finished. Before leaving the valley, we each picked a few branches of the willows which shaded the tomb. And with sadness in our hearts, we slowly took the road back to Larwood, turning from time to time to cast our eyes towards the spot where lie the Emperor's remains. We learned that after we left the valley, the Masons continued to work at the bottom of the grave and that they placed stones to bring it up to the level of the ground and surround it with a border of turf which was protected by a railing. We also learned that the governor had placed a detachment of men commanded by an officer to guard the place. Plunged in the deepest reflections, we returned along with this spot, which had been animated by the emperor's presence, was now only a desert. We went looking through the apartments. We wandered through the gardens. We stopped at the spots where he most frequently was, those in which he was wont to rest, We thought we saw him. Alas, it was only illusion. We shall never see him at Longwood except in our thoughts. He is no more. His body, deprived of life, is down there, shut up in a narrow place, shaded by a few weeping willows. The End